Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host this week, Dr. W.F. Strong. Our book this week is Jackson Land by Steve Inskeep of Morning Edition. The subtitle is President Andrew Jackson, Cherokee John Ross, and a Great American Land Grab. It's essentially the story that many of us heard in school about the Trail of Tears. It talks about how the Cherokee Indian nation was removed from the southeastern U.S. westward. And Steve Inskeep, who many of you are probably familiar with since he's on NPR every day, has spent a couple of years of his life uh, researching this, and he's researched it very carefully, and it's a beautiful read. Reminds me of Empire of the Summer Moon. If you read that about the Comanche Indians, it's a very powerful and beautiful book, and this is in that genre. So let's talk to Steve now. As I read your book, I couldn't uh, help but make a comparison to Empire of the Summer Moon, uh, but the tribes, of course, very different in terms of their the Cherokee. I mean, the Comanche fought a long time, and, yeah. and the Cherokee tried to assimilate really into the political system. And uh, did, can you go with that comparison to some extent? Oh, yeah, I think that's a brilliant comparison, and that's a brilliant book, uh, by the way. I really, really like that uh, like that book by S.C. Gwynn, and it's, uh, it, it's totally worth the read and really dramatic and had a lot of history in it that I just uh, didn't particularly, particularly know. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the dramatic story of that he picks one a native leader, one Comanche leader, and and pairs him off in a sense against one uh, white leader, one American leader. Mm-hmm. So actually, the structure is even a little similar to to Jackson Land in that again we have one white leader and one Native American leader. I think what's different here is the tactics that were used. Yes. What we have happening in Jackson Land is not a war, although there's plenty of warring in it, as you know, uh, but essentially a battle within the democratic system by a Native American leader who wanted to be part of that system and wanted his people to be part of the system and become some kind of territory or state of the United States. And in that drive, John Ross found himself in conflict with Andrew Jackson, who was the greatest single figure in clearing Indian land for white settlement and creating what we now know as the Deep South. If... This had not occurred if uh, Jackson hadn't successfully moved the Cherokee Nation westward. Uh, what would it look like today in Georgia, for instance? Would well, there are several alternatives, and I go through several possibilities. One is um, that the Cherokees would become some kind of territory or state, as they aspire to be, that you just break off land that that theoretically belonged to Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, and some other states, Mm -hmm. and turned that into a separate territory and eventually a state. Uh, Other states were broken up in that way to create new states. Tennessee itself had been part of North Carolina at one time, for example. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of plausible, but not racially plausible. It wasn't plausible that people would be that fair to Indians and welcome them that fully into the republic. There were other opportunities Uh, One of them was just leave the Cherokee Nation where it was. It had been allowed certain rights by treaty from the United States since the early days of the Republic. They wanted to stay there and maintain a certain kind of sovereignty, and that could have continued for a while longer. That would have been very difficult because there was such immense pressure of white settlement. People really, really wanted that real estate. So it would have been a real challenge for Andrew Jackson, who was president by the end of our story, to make that happen, but it was plausible. And uh, another option is simply that, uh, well, I mean, you can, you can come where I am today in western North Carolina and see how things might have been different, because there was a fragment of the Cherokee Nation that resisted being removed in 1838, that retreated farther into the Appalachians, mm-hmm. into the hills of western North Carolina, mm-hmm. and ultimately a small group of them was allowed to stay, mm-hmm. and they're still here. And there's a town called Cherokee, North Carolina, in mm-hmm. Cherokee County, oh, North Carolina, that. And it's next to a reservation. So they got their reservation long after the fact. Yes. um, It's a complicated story, but they were allowed in the moment to remain. The U.S. government didn't find it to be worth the trouble to particularly chase them. Mm -hmm. And so the soldiers said, if you will give up uh, one particular Cherokee, 
and his son, I believe, sons, I believe, who were uh, accused of killing white soldiers, oh. then we'll let the rest of you stay. The <clears throat> deal was made, and they were allowed to stay. Some of them were already citizens of the United States, and through a very complicated and slow and painful process, <clears throat> they've been integrated into the fabric of the South in a way that seems perfectly natural here and seems perfectly appropriate. There is certain sovereignty that remains with the eastern band of the Cherokee, and there's other kinds of, of issues in which the state or the federal government predominate. I heard a theory advanced about uh, 20 years ago by a man, and um, it was a, a professor at a, at a university, at University of Arizona, actually, and he said that the Indians who held out militarily the longest got the best deal. Is that true? I don't know if it's true or not. I think that in the case of the, mm -hmm. the Indian nations that I studied most closely, mm -hmm. the Indian nations of the South, it's not necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a couple of case histories you can study. There are the Cherokees, who we just discussed, who fought within the democratic system and held out for many years and ultimately were moved. Then there are the Seminoles, who uh, did treaty negotiations for a while, ultimately, however, in about 1835, rebelled, and ended up fighting a war that lasted, uh, I think, about as long as the United States' involvement in Vietnam, mm -hmm. uh, an unbelievably brutal and bloody war in the swamps and the wilderness of what was then Florida, or what Florida was yes. like then. And, and uh, tons of people were killed. More than 1,500 U.S. soldiers were killed. I don't even know how many Seminoles and other kinds of civilians were killed. I'm not sure anybody knows. Yeah. But it was a terribly bloody conflict. And in the end, they too were removed anyway. So I think it is arguable whether um, military resistance did any better than democratic resistance. Mm -hmm. And I will say this. Um, I think that the Cherokee example of fighting uh, within the system and when the system failed them using a form of kind of peaceful protest or almost civil disobedience in the end, uh, at least marked history. Uh, this is something that elementary school kids learn about and can absorb and debate and think about and often conclude was just wrong. To me, one of the saddest parts of your book is when you talk about uh about Winfield Scott coming to move them, and they've got their fields planted, and the fields are sprouting, and the fields are looking particularly good that year, and the gardens yeah. are coming up, and in the midst of this, they round them up, and they have to walk away from their homes and their crops. That, uh, I mean, it's so sad to me to, to think of that, that for children uh, that are of that time who had known nothing else but this farm, and they were just suddenly removed. Yeah. Well, that to me was the act of civil disobedience that I was referring to. Mm -hmm. The Cherokees had been told they must move by May 23rd, 1838. A treaty had even been signed by some Cherokees, although they were a minority faction of the Cherokee Nation. And the deadline was May 23rd. They had to leave. And federal officials, as you said, discovered that in April of that same year, you had Cherokees planting corn crops as if they expected to be there in the fall. Mm -hmm. And their leader, John Ross, had told them to do nothing to suggest that they were willing to move. And it's an astonishing thing, and it does bring tears to people's eyes to learn that particular detail mm -hmm. um, at the, uh, of this true story. At, at the same time, it was a tactic. John Ross was in Washington trying to negotiate a better deal for his people, and it was the realization that they weren't going anywhere that they would have to be prodded out at the ends of bayonets, that it could be a humanitarian disaster that finally caused federal officials not to change their policy, not to let the Cherokees stay, but at least to do some negotiating to uh, meaningfully improve the terms on which they would be moved. Another thing I didn't know, because I, I think most of us knew about the Trail of Tears, but I didn't know that two groups had gone ahead voluntarily uh, of, of the, the holdouts, yeah. you might say. Yeah, well, they they were the uh, they were the minority who had agreed to sign that treaty, mm -hmm. which was never accepted by the legal Cherokee government, but was signed by this minority. And there was a leader named Major Ridge, who was very wealthy and very respected, and had been a great leader of the Cherokee people for quite some time. And Major Ridge and others put their signatures on that treaty and agreed to move in good order and well before the deadline early. And they, uh, in, the, in the initial party to go out anyway, they didn't lose a single person. 
Another party went out by this long land route and did have a number of deaths on the way, and that was sort of foreshadowing, foreshadowing of what was going to happen when other Cherokee parties moved west later. But that is part of the complexity of this story. You can argue that fewer Cherokees might have been killed if they had accepted defeat and just moved at the best possible time for them because they'd been given a couple of years' advance warning. But that was not the way that their leader, John Ross, saw it. He wanted them to gain their rights, and even when he realized that he could not uh, preserve the land, he wanted to get the best deal for the Cherokee people that he could. Well, Steve, I've listened to you on uh, NPR's Morning Edition for many years, and uh, when I read this book, I wondered, when did you have time to write this? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for asking. Uh-huh. Um, you may notice that I'm on early in the morning. I have uh-huh. an early morning job. Mm-hmm. That has its difficulties, but also its rewards, and one of them is that many days, not every day by any means, but many days, I'm off work in the early afternoon. And I was able to go down to the Library of Congress in Washington, which is not all that far from the NPR studios, and you can read original letters by Andrew Jackson, and you can find books full of letters by John Ross, and you can find hundreds of other primary sources like actual copies of the Cherokee Phoenix, the Cherokee newspaper from that time. I did that, and I also took some time off work and did some driving around uh, the South, the, the region that I call Jackson Land, and tried to take it all in that way. And to be honest, there's one other thing. Uh Even when I was working my day job, it affected my thinking about this other project that I was engaged in because Mm -hmm. it's a story of American politics. I got involved in 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 it in the first place because I covered politics day by day, and that gets me thinking about history and how we got here and how our system developed as it has. And so I explored this story of the past, and I kept seeing one connection after another between the past and now. One thing I really appreciated about the book uh, are all the the intricate details that you provide uh, that aren't necessarily related directly to the story, but they're fascinating. One example is uh, Harvard in the early 1800s had 20,000 books, and that was just considered phenomenal. I love yeah. little details yeah, I, like I, that. I love the details of a developing nation. Mm-hmm. And to me, that was that, maybe that's one of the reasons that people might like to read this book. It's certainly mm-hmm. one of the reasons that I wanted to write it, because it was an opportunity to go back in time to this country that was so recognizable and yet so different. And you just hit on one of the great details. Harvard was there then, mm-hmm. but it was a different institution. And we were in a different world of information where a library with 20,000 volumes was this incredible achievement that a visitor described as perhaps being better than any of the university libraries that were available then in Europe. And, of course, now any of us practically can go on the Internet at practically any time and have quick access to millions of books, never mind 20,000 of them. And uh, you might not even have to pay anything for a lot of those books. And so we're in a different world, but it was still a recognizable world then. And you had people who were, for example, working the media as it existed then, to get their message out in a new democratic society. And they were doing those things for the first time in America because the democratic society that we know Mm -hmm. and the democratic institutions that we know were just taking shape. Yeah, that's one of the beautiful things about the book is you put this, uh, you lay out this uh, background tapestry that uh, provides context that helps us understand the story you want to tell. So it's wonderfully done. So you're on a tour right now, so I know that um, I'm about out of time here. I had uh, just one more question. How did you get interested in uh, in Indians? Well, I think that, that what I was most interested in was democracy itself mm-hmm. and the role of different kinds of people in a democracy. And so I kind of got to the Cherokee story through that, through that different door or that back door, mm-hmm. if you will. I was interested in them as players in a democratic society. They weren't, most of them weren't citizens in the time that I described, but they were, they were taking part in democratic debates and trying to gain their rights in, in democratic debates. I ended up, though, becoming more and more interested in their history, and I particularly focused on John Ross for a variety of reasons, but one of them was this. 
this is a guy who left hundreds of his own letters, which he wrote because he was literate in English. Mm -hmm. That makes him different from a lot of other native leaders of that time, because so many of them were not literate, or whatever they wrote has not survived. Mm -hmm. And so what we know of them passes through white observers, mm -hmm. many of whom were sympathetic, some of whom were unsympathetic, but in any case, they were... It, it's it's second-hand information. Yes, there are point. brilliant scholars from whom I've learned a lot who try to go through that second-hand information and reverse engineer whatever information they can about about Cherokee culture or other Indian cultures. But I had a chance by focusing on this one guy, John Ross, to hear this guy speak in his own words because he told his story in so many thousands of words right. that are preserved. You hear the nuances of his own thinking. Well, Steve, thanks a lot for joining us this morning. Uh, good luck on your tour, and I'll, I'll catch you on Morning Edition as I do every day. Today we have a second uh, interview with uh, Bina Kamlani, who is uh, the editor of Saul Bellow. Now, Saul Bellow, you may recall, is uh, probably, by many standards, the best writer of the 20th century. I mean, he won the Nobel Prize, he won the Pulitzer Prize, uh, he is probably one of the most um, awarded writers in uh, recent American history, certainly up there with Hemingway and any other uh, great American writer you, you could name. Some call him the Twain of the 20th century. But uh, Penguin, they're celebrating uh, what they call the Penguin Classics 100 Years of Saul Bellow. Uh, really, it's uh, kind of 80 years of publishing Bellow, I guess, but... Uh, they uh, are celebrating the fact that if he had lived, he would be 100 years old this month. And so uh, Penguin's, Penguin's Classics celebrates 100 years of Saul Bellow. And to this extent, they are reissuing uh, you know, two books that are classic, classics of his, uh, Herzog uh, and uh, Ravelstein. And Herzog is the story of Moses Herzog, who is a great sufferer. He's a joker, a mourner, a charmer. A uh, serial writer of unsent letters, he's a survivor, both of his private disasters and those of the age in which he lives. Uh, this was the winner of the National Book Award uh, 50 years ago. R Ravelstein is another of his classic works, and it's being reissued in that uh, famous uh, Penguin Classics uh, black color, black spine, I think they call it. And uh, Ravelstein is a deeply insightful book. It is a, a journey through love and memory. It is an elegy to friendship. It's a, a poignant meditation on death. It's told in memoir form, and it follows two university professors, one of whom is succumbing to AIDS, and uh, they share thoughts on uh, philosophy and history, loves, friends, mortality, art, everything. So uh, both of them wonderful books, and they're reissuing those this year as a celebration of Saul Bellow's uh, hundred year of his hundredth year anniversary, you might say. So we're going to talk to his uh, longtime editor, uh, Bina Kamlani, and uh, you'll enjoy her. She's a fascinating woman. So let's uh, talk to her now. Welcome, Bina, to the show. My first question for you is this. It must be terribly daunting, I would assume, to be assigned as editor to someone who's already won the Nobel Prize. Was that kind of frightening? Uh, yes, it was in a way, but I have the most perfect conduit uh, to Bellow because mm -hmm. um, his copy editor was a very dear friend of mine, uh -huh. and we had worked together on several books, mm -hmm. even before I joined Viking uh, at Harper and Row. She had been on retainer there, and um, so she and I had worked uh, closely on, on many books and mm -hmm. had become very close friends. Mm -hmm. So when I joined Viking, uh, she was in the contract as his copy editor, and it was natural that she and I worked together. Mm -hmm. So we continued this uh, teamwork um, uh, until one day she said, well, I'm taking you to meet him. Mm -hmm. And um, we drove up to Vermont, and I met him, you know, for the second time. The first time had been so brief that... Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm not sure he even remembered me, but uh, in Vermont, yes, we we had a wonderful time. I met his wife, who was lovely, and, um, you know, and uh, we spent uh, the day with them. Mm -hmm. Uh, We had lunch together. We went off for a big walk, a long walk. We watched the cows and... Uh, you know, and uh, <laughs> tried to hunt for the moose and came back, and it was just a, an absolutely glorious day. Um, uh, unforgettable. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had been very nervous about meeting him because I'd read him as a child, and this was, you know, I hero worshipped him. Mm-hmm. So it's always a bit daunting, it's always <laughs> a bit nerve wracking uh, to to meet someone like that. But uh, but he he was so uh, charming and uh, uh, welcoming and funny and uh, warm, warm. Uh, that one was put at one's ease immediately, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, I, I had, uh, 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 I was, to, I continued to be daunted. I was never <laughs> not daunted, <laughs> but I wasn't as daunted uh, after that. So, um, yeah. it's a wonderful story. Yes. <laughs> what do you think uh, the average person who reads Bello or has read a few of his books? What do they not know about him? based upon your knowledge of the private man? You know, there may be this perception that the intellectualism of some of his books is a sort of barrier, perhaps. Uh-huh. But I, I think completely the opposite. I think, I think that, the, that what's at the heart of his work are these essential questions that we all must ask ourselves, or if we don't, uh, we avoid asking them because we fear the answers. He um, had the courage to do so, to ask the questions almost nobody asks, you know. Uh, but he also saw life at its uh, very, you know, sort of common level. He grew up in Chicago <clears throat> within an immigrant family. He saw the struggles and challenges of trying to make it, of trying to be successful. These are situations that are common to us all, to Mm -hmm. everyone. We can all find uh, an equivalent for this in our own lives, you know. So I think that the combination of that with his knowledge of everyday life in the streets, he had a street smartness Mm -hmm. about him. Uh, He knew what was going on. He had this canny knowledge of what was going on in Chicago, the mobsters, the underbelly. He had a very deep sense of of the place. He lived in a very dangerous part of Chicago up until his last days, right? Yes, exactly. And and Chicago continued for him because he was an academic there, you mm-hmm. know, so at the University of Chicago. He went to school at Northwestern. He um it's part of his backdrop. He experienced it in so many ways as a child, as a student, mm-hmm. as a college student and as an academic. I think in a way his writing represents that spectrum. You know, he mm-hmm. went from the struggling everyday uh life mm-hmm of most families in that in that area that of Chicago to uh becoming this incredible intell- you know uh, uh uh academic at at a university um and being true to his calling which was the writing so he never actually forgot that it you know for- forgot where he came from and it's embedded in his work he himself put it this way. He said that somewhere in his journals, Dostoevsky remarks that a writer can begin anywhere at the most commonplace thing, scratch around in it long enough, pry and dig away long enough, and lo, soon he will hit upon the marvelous. <laughs> um, and that, that lo- you know, losing touch with the common life was something he dreaded, and he yeah. never lost it as a result. Well, let me tell you a story of my own. When I was in college, I took an undergraduate course. We read Moby Dick. We read Camus. Camus the Stranger. Yeah. But then we came to, and I just plodded through, and they were okay. I'd heard of them. I, I kind of had the response, uh, you know, Twain to find a classic as uh, books that everybody talks about but nobody reads. And uh, here we were, you know, reading these, and, uh, and I liked them. They were good. But then we came to Henderson, the Rain King, and it just took my head off. 
I mean, I was just so excited by this book because it's fabulous, isn't I, it? I was this, you know, redneck from Texas and I connected with Bellow and I didn't expect to. And it was that book that made me years later go to Africa to teach because he put it in my head that I needed this experience. And uh, how wonderful. Isn't that, isn't that cool? <laughs> how uh, wonderful that so it was a life altering it was uh, yes. uh, a thing that yeah. happened to you but <laughs> it was his way of connecting I would say with uh, the common man that yes, inspired exactly. that desire within me and I remember as I was flying to Africa and I was looking down at the clouds I remembered Bellow's line from that book you may not recall it because it's just a little line but uh, to me it was important he said that uh, we are the first generation to dream down at the clouds and so oh how wonderful so he had a great impact on me and I went on to read other books but that one uh, has always remained with me a, a powerful force in my life for you that one line has stayed with you forever yes you know I have boosted sticking out of every one <laughs> you know it's I mean it's <laughs> It's it's very difficult to say this one, not that one. Mm -hmm. Read this, don't read that. Um, very very difficult thing because all of them have such nuggets of. Sometimes it's it's like it's like um, it's like being struck by uh, uh, lightning mm -hmm. or something because you suddenly see something so clearly and you think, my God, that's what that's about, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yes. And I. I think that I think it is an amazing thing uh, to be able to do that to to have to have created this continuum that for those of us who like the intellectual journey uh who want to rush back to our libraries and say really did Socrates say that <laughs> where you know or you know or or did pound or did yeats or did Auden, or you know wh where would that be you know so if if you read to learn more then and if you read to to go deep to learn more, go deep, uh, <laughs> and understand not only oneself, but also understand the world around us, then Bellow wins, hands down. So I wanted to make sure we talk about the event that we are celebrating, the 100th uh, anniversary, uh, actually tomorrow, of, yes. uh, of Bellow. If he had lived, he'd be 100 years old, and so Penguin is doing the uh, Penguin Classic celebrates 100 years of Saul Bellow. And so to that extent, there are these two new books that are being, or whether well, they're not new books, but they're new editions of the books, right? So yes. t well, tell me about them. Mm -hmm. Tell me about both of them and, and how each is a unique celebration, so to speak. Well, Herzog is a beloved work, so mm -hmm. we decided to put it in this special deluxe classic format with a brand new cover. It has an introduction by Philip Roth. Wow. Um, the cover is absolutely stunning. Um, and Ravelstein, we've put into now the, these very handsome uh, Penguin Black Classics uh, mm -hmm. editions. And uh, our intent is to reach as many, a uh, new readership, mm -hmm. as many uh, uh, as many new readers as we can uh, with Bello, and especially introduce him to a younger uh, audience. Can you make a case for, uh, let's say, a kid who's a college kid who's 20 or 20, 24, 25, something like that, uh, why they should read Bello? Well, it's happening more than you think. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I taught... Um, you know, I, I sort of, I, well, I taught editing at NYU for a while, and now I teach at Hunter. And Ravelstein always sees the day are required reading for the course. And you would be amazed at how many people love Bello after mm -hmm. they've read him. You yeah. know, so I'm convinced that it's a matter of of getting these books out to as many young readers as possible. There is something about Bellow's work in Seize the Day, in Herzog, in uh, Something to Remember Me By, in uh, so many of these books mm -hmm. that really speaks to the heart of what it is to be young mm -hmm. and helpless and raging and <laughs> uh, frustrated by what you can and cannot do. There is absolutely no subject that we've thought of that he hasn't articulated 
modulated in some incredible way. And this is why I think he just needs to be made accessible. And through these new covers, the new packaging, new introductions written by contemporaries uh, of theirs, Mm -hmm. younger writers, we hope to reach this incredible new audience out there that I'm convinced is just waiting to to read Bellow. I think you're right, and I'm going to do <laughs> all I can to to push that notion because for me it was a transforming event to discover Bellow. You see, mm-hmm. you yourself are a prime example yes, of this. Yes. 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 Yeah. Exactly. So push it. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, I, I did a, a Fulbright in Africa, and I wouldn't have done that, I think, had I not read Henderson the Rain King that put the whole idea in my what mind. What an amazing, <laughs> what an amazing story. Yes. Well, I think, I think that's, that's just incredible. And, uh, yes, let's hope that, uh, you mm. know, Bella will go on and on and oh, on. Oh, absolutely. He just will. Yes. He just will. Okay, so that's it, our double header for Good Books Radio this day. I've been your host, Dr. W.F. Strong. I want to thank audiobooks.com, our underwriter, for keeping our program on the air or helping to keep it there. And uh, again, want to remind you that if you would like to hear this interview again, you can go to our YouTube channel, Good Books Radio, and listen to it, or our Facebook page, Good Books Radio. And I'm Dr. W.F. Strong signing off, hoping that all your books are good reads. Thank you.